All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Jasper from the Rosalind Supper Club. Thanks for joining. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Happy to do this. For people who don't know, what is the Supper Club? What is it? Yeah, so Roslyn is a private dining experience. It is a pop up space currently out of my home and also in a new location with our partnership with Little City Farms. It's a beautiful spot. Absolutely great beautiful. team. So imagine just coming in, having a great time. There's craft cocktails, you have wine pairings, it's eight courses usually, wow. individual shared plates, and everything I do is new American French with Asian flavors in it. What made you want to do this? What was the, what was your journey either as a chef yeah. or to, to food in general? You, you mentioned you were in tech before. That's right. So what were you doing in tech prior to all of this? Yeah, it's uh, it's been a journey for sure. Yeah. I started as a product manager and okay. also did business development and marketing. What was the product that you were working on? There was a company I worked for called Multiplied up in San Francisco, and they did PR for a lot of the blockchain companies at the time. And so I was flying in between here in uh, LA and SF and the pandemic hit. Yeah. Then I got stationed down here at another company called Star 8, which failed. But at that time, I was just like, I don't know what to do with myself. And I had known that for the last 10 years, I had basically been working for the man who didn't care about me. I was just a replaceable number. Ouch. And exactly. Yeah, the right? hard reality. It's true. The hard reality. Yeah. So the, the journey to answer your question really started in, in, it was like around February 2020. My old boss didn't think COVID was a real thing. So he flew me out to Florida for a trade show. I had a life altering event where I basically got bit by a spider right here. And I still have a scar from it. Holy shit. And what kind of spider was it? They said it was a brown recalls. What? Yeah, I know. Apparently the fang got lodged in here. I had to go through surgery literally the day of the pandemic shut down here in LA. So it was just me at Good Samaritan with Dr. Billings. Thank you for saving my life. And she took it out and she said that you were infected with a microbacteria similar to TB, almost killed you. And uh, if you'd waited 24 to 48 more hours, you would have been dead. How did you get bitten by this, the recluse spider? How I was, I was sleeping okay. at the Embassy Suites, Orlando. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, I was sleeping there. And then, then I came back. I got sicker and sicker. And that, so you didn't know? I didn't know. But you, maybe your hand was swollen or something. It's very swollen. Imagine like the most yeah. giant pimple ever. Okay. And so the long story short is after going through that, I was like, I don't know what to do. Because I for sure knew I wanted to leave tech. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. Uh, and then May 2020, one of my chef friends, Chef Andrew, used to work at Auburn, a couple of the restaurants. Oh, nice. He Auburn was, was my favorite restaurant here I in know, LA. and it's gone. It's gone. RIP. RIP to Auburn. It was literally my favorite restaurant in LA. I know. They had a short run, and then COVID yeah. came at the worst timing. I know. I remember ordering their food during COVID, mm-hmm. and it would come in like seven or eight different things. You know, to, And they tried, but it was like it, fine dining doesn't really work in a, in a to-go type environment. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. translate. The flavor, translate. the texture, the heat even. That's so, a bummer. Great spot, though. I know. Really, really good program. But yeah, he basically hit me up saying, hey, the world's ending. Do you want to learn how to cook? And I actually said no, but I would love to have you guys over at my place. I love hosting. I'm happy to like have you guys bring some friends. So I invited some chef friends. He brought some chef friends table kind of like this at my home. And uh, I was more excited about the giant block of bluefin and the 90 day dry aged wagyu at the time that was sitting at one of their fridges to wow. eat it. Yeah. But I'm very much so like an active service guy. So I was like, hey, how can I help? Okay. And so that led to them realizing I didn't know how to cook at all. Like I'm talking like second time, slice my finger. Chef Gabe, who became my first mentor, he was like, hey, let me show you the basics. And then it evolved into understanding me's and preparation and proteins and then i was like oh this is actually a lot of fun like i love this take a lab got to be creative yeah and i never got to be creative my entire life until then okay so i was like this is cool so they taught you you were like privately trained in some way yeah i would say privately trained absolutely yeah it was more like friends showing how to cook okay so then you take this idea and you go all right i want to become like a a legit i want to offer people something to to do Mm -hmm. and so how does how does the supper club land yeah, so it, it took almost a year for that to actually happen. August 2020 is when I came up with the name Roslyn, a friend of mine from New York. What does it mean? It's actually a lot simpler than everyone thinks it is. I live on Rose Street. My last name is Lynn, L-Y-N-N. The reason why, though, I named it that is the project was supposed to be as temporary as the name. I was actually trying to move out of L.A., okay. put my place up to sale. I was going to go to, like, Hong Kong or, you know, Taiwan because it was kind of open. But this thing snowballed into this whole animal where I realized that I had this huge passion of bringing people together and also eating really great food. And if you're able to combine those two, then you create an experience where people are going to go, wow, I remember that. So that's how Roslyn came to be. And then August 2021 is when I woke up one day and I was like, I can't do both. I can't do my tech job and this. And so I quit uh, with no notice. You quit your tech job? (laughs) Yeah. Was that terrifying or were you just ready? I was ready mentally, but financially I was terrified because, you know, you don't have runway when you're doing food and we're serving the most expensive stuff. I'm talking like your Hokkaido scallops, Australian Wagyu, you know, we're dry aging stuff. We have preparation. We have a huge team, Mm -hmm. but 
you know, when, when else are you going to do it? When, you, when else are you going to take the leap of faith? So you took it. Yeah. And then how did you solve for the money part? Kept pushing harder. I think I took a, I, I'm very grateful because all, all the people always ask me is like, if you had done it again, would you have done it earlier? And I, my answer now is no. You know, in hindsight, I was like, thank God I had worked in tech for so long because I even run my company on sprints. Mm-hmm. And the way I market everything is done very much so about virality and, and word of mouth. So if I had not done that, I wouldn't be able to do what we're doing today. That's a good answer. That's a good way of looking at it. Everything connects. The sprint thing is a good thing. I, I, so I, I sort of, I'm in the restaurant game a little bit, yeah. as you know. And in it, I just realize how much of the tech or just management philosophies from different things that I've experienced have been super helpful in in the restaurant environment, yeah, right? And so like just being diligent with, uh, just communication in general. I think the biggest thing I learned in tech, and you'll know this because you were a product manager, you could say something to the dev team Mm -hmm. and then you can say the same thing, same word to the sales team and it means 80 different things. It's like, when is the product gonna be ready is a good example. Mm -hmm. The sales teams will hear, oh, May, cool. Dev team says, yeah, May. But product ready doesn't mean it's ready. It means like it goes into the built environment or like the safe environment mm-hmm. so they can like bug test essentially. Right. Right. So it's not open to the public mm-hmm. and it won't be for a couple more months. And so just the, I think back of house and front of house have, have a similar thing where it's like Very not much. everybody understands each other. They're saying the same thing. It sounds like they are, but I don't know. Having to decipher code of the language is pretty meaningful. Yeah. It certainly Um, feels that way. Yeah. Like, and as I've learned more and more about the restaurant industry in the last three and a half years, I definitely feel the same way, right? If you don't bridge between the front of house, back of house, or even like your guests and their understanding of what the experience is going to be like, you're just going to have people turning over and they like, I don't get what happened here. Right. What did you learn in the hospitality side or what did you see on the hospitality side service element that you wanted to change? Maybe, right. Cause you're bringing fresh eyes to that too. And Mm -hmm. I would say in general, LA isn't known for great service because most of the people in LA want to do something else. They want to be a writer, an actor. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a secondary job and they're going through the motions of it and sure they might do well, but it's not their primary, they're not like in hospitality per se, like other major cities. And so what did you see on the hospitality side where you're like, I think we can make this a unique experience? 100%. I think it goes back to working in tech. I used to literally dine out like 14 meals a week. You know, I'm talking like yeah. lunch and dinner, yeah. right? Yeah. So I would go to my favorite restaurants and I would pick up on these things. I like really enjoy it when someone refills my water and it's always chilled, yeah. right? Or like if my glass needs to be taken away, they'll do it. But I'm not looking for that Michelin stuff. I don't need if my napkin drops on the floor, someone immediately, I think that stuff is ludicrous personally. It's more about like, are you giving me the service and does the food taste amazing? And the other thing though, I think is my ethos is I want to know why you put that on my plate. Because a lot of restaurants to this day will be like, hey, here you go. You ordered the scallops. I was like, so where are they from? Why did you guys source them? You say they're seasonal, yeah. right? Where, you know, why are they seasonal? Because there's so much bullshit. Like, I'm sorry to say, there's so much <laughs> bullshit so in the true. restaurant industry. And it's like, for me, when I went <laughs> to those restaurants that I love because the chef or one of their team members would be like, yeah, that scallop is from Hokkaido. We got it in yesterday. And the reason why we chose that over a local diver scallop is because the waters are colder there right now. So it's firmer, it's sweeter. And I'm like, hell yeah. Yeah. This matters Tell to the me. story. Right. Yeah. Tell me the story. Yeah. I was in Vegas and the, there was like a really nice restaurant. And mm. they were like, oh, we have an oyster special. And I was like, cool. Where are they from? And they were like, Washington. Mm. And I go, the state? And they're like, yeah. And I go, any more specifics? And they're like, Washington. <laughs> Not into being cushy or kumiai or something like that, no. And I was like, can you go ask? And they're like, no, they're from Washington. And I go, that's not a place where oysters are from. Like, I hear you, but it's like, there's a, there's, it could be, there's options as you just mentioned. Yes, correct. And half the table was like, Diego, what is wrong with you? Like, why are you being that guy? And I'm like, no, because like kushis are some of my favorite oysters. Yes. And so if they're kushis, I'm going to get them. Mm -hmm. But if they're not, all good, we'll probably get them anyway. But he should know. Absolutely. And the guy was so, I don't know, he got like kind of mad at me. And I was surprised by that because it's not a crazy question to be like, where are they from? Yeah. Yeah. And And if you go to any normal oyster bar, you'll see, they'll tell you exactly where they're from. Exactly. And it's, and it matters, right? Going back to your question about hospitality and like how that, how I want to change that. Right. I see it where there's too much of the pizzazz and Instagram photo-y pretty stuff. Like, don't get me wrong. I love that stuff too. Yeah, Yeah. But it shouldn't be the primary focus. In LA, at least I've seen, you have to choose between somewhere pretty really nice location or good food. You can't have all three. There's very, very few restaurants like that here. And so I'm trying to make that shift where we're able to do all three and also though, pay our people the fair wage that they deserve. 
you know, we're 25, 30% above market in terms of how we pay our people, yet our margins are the same. And so we're able to do that because we run a tighter ship. And I think it comes back to, to being tech. in tech. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Give people a window into it. They sign up for the, for the supper club. What are, they, what are they expecting? What can they expect? Best night ever, romantic, sunset. Give people a window. We're sitting down. Close your eyes. Walk us through it. Well, you women are going like, to talk really close about it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Nick loves the ASMR when he's uh, well, um, <laughs> editing. The most beautiful thing about Roslyn is it, how it brings people together. So I'm talking about you come in at 7 o'clock. You're here with your date. You're here with your best friend. What's the dress code? Everyone dresses up. Okay. So, you know, it's California formal. You know, some people wear really nice cocktail dresses. Other people like a little more, you know, casual sundress or for guys, maybe a suit. But they don't wear like the full button up. Sure, sure, know? sure. Not a tux. No, not, not necessary. That's that's trying a little too hard. <laughs> it's not the magic castle. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. There is a lot of magic, but not the magic castle. Correct. And so you come in for cocktail hour and we have a whole team of craft bartenders and their specialty is to incorporate whatever side ingredients that are left over and we actually utilize them in the drinks. So imagine like we have a beer called pork from Compo. We take that fat, we fat wash it with some bourbon and that's served to you as an option. We don't like to waste. So we have cilantro stems. We like to serve tacos. I'm a huge taco fan. And so we take the stems, make it into a syrup and we have a drink called the Mexican street cart that uses the cilantro syrup and our own house tahini. And so you get unlimited craft cocktails. That's the first thing. Like you get to enjoy it, you tip the bartender. But then after that, you get to socialize with 16 or now with our new Little Cities Farm pop-up up to 40 other people just socializing, getting to know people. And the crazy part is no one knows what's on the menu aside from the structure. You walk in that week and you know that there's going to be maybe two veggies, three seafood, and maybe two meats. Okay. And that's it. Okay. We don't tell you the menu. So it creates a level of curiosity. And then you go like, okay, I have a general idea of what they serve based off our Instagram and whatever else. But when you're there, you're curious and you know, everyone is there for the food. And so people walk out with friends, business partners. We had someone who get married. They met at a cocktail hour and now they're married. Wow. I'm saying you can find love here. You can find love. Nick, you heard that? You can bring your dates there. <laughs> exactly. Nick. And on today's show, we're going to give away two tickets to your next venue. Absolutely. Or, or one of three of the next events. Yeah. So we are here for it. And uh, we're very, very happy to be partnering with Little City Farms. I'll be taking over as culinary director there for until the end of the summer for the Roslyn Summer Series. And we're kicking it off really strong with all the chef friends that I've met over the last three and a half years. So we have uh, Chef Christian, who is currently the CDC at Girl and the Goat. He and I are partnering to do opening night on the 25th, and that one's just going to be fun. It's, you know, girl and the goat, punchy flavors, just what I love, but also he's Filipino, so we're bringing that in. 26 is my friend, uh, Chef Stefan Tregilio, uh, former Keller and Bouchon guy. Now he's opening Leonardo's over in Whittier. So we're going to be doing a French Laundry seafood-inspired dinner because I love seafood, and that's going to be on the 26th. The 27th is my very dear friend, Chef Daphne Mayhew from Hell's Kitchen Season 21. She was the finalist. So we're packing a punch. So obviously we'd love to have Stack you guys. Stacking the deck. Stacking the deck. And we'll get it. all your viewers over here and listeners too. But yeah. obviously I think you guys should just bring your dates. We'll do that. And then outside <laughs> of that, you're not stopping there. You're launching a sauce. That's tell right. Us, tell us what's the sauce. You got 12 in the queue. You said you're on, you're on the first one. What is it? Yeah. So uh, about two and a half months ago, we launched at Smorgasbord a brand called Yeet Hay. It's spelled Y-E-A-T-H-A-Y. The name comes from me being a Cantonese boy. And growing up, there was a term where your mom would yell at you because you're eating something that's fried or spicy, and it creates yeet hay, which is literally like hot air. It's, it's supposed to be a negative connotation, but if someone who's of any type of Chinese descent, they'll go like, oh, cool, that's crazy. So we have the trademark for it, and we're like, okay, what do I want to do with this? I want to showcase this love of food, growing up in the San Gabriel Valley, trying all these different unique flavors. I actually grew up in Huntington Park before that, but we have all these different kind of combinations of how California has, you know, like Mexican and Chinese and Japanese and Korean flavors. These sauces are what we've built at Roslyn over the last three and a half years. And now we've started to make them all basically shelf stable with no preservatives. We use the exact same ingredients that we do at the fine dining establishments and farmers markets and whatnot. And so the first one is Yi Hei Sichuan Chimichurri. And it's got cilantro, scallions, Sichuan peppercorns, pickled garlic with rice wine vinegar. We partnered with Grazo on that as well. So we use their top tier olive oil in there. And it just lasts on shelves for six to eight months. No refrigeration necessary. It's just punchy, herbaceous. We serve it with scallops. We just did that this morning at KTLA. And then I love it with Wagyu. 
Like I'm a sucker for that. Okay. So I can't wait to try this. This is going to be amazing. I will drop off a couple of jars as soon as we can keep them in stock. (laughs) We've been selling out back to back. It's crazy. Do you want to start a CPG company or is this just sort of your way of testing the market and seeing what's available today? Where do you view it? I see it going definitely in that direction in terms of creating a CPG brand. Because I, I, I think that beyond the sauce is the fact that we have a cultural term that is near and dear to you know, millions. And uh, the goal with Eat Hay is to start with the sauces and then expand it into like streetwear and branding and clothing. And, and um, I think we could do so much with it because the term itself is, it almost sounds like a Gen Z term, right? like yeet and then hay, like it, it's kind of, it's just weird that it kind of came together. It's like the rappers, like, yeet, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that's hilarious. What else is on deck for you? What can you tell us? Oh, got man. so much going on. So we got the supper club, we got this CPG product, CPG company maybe forming from that, creating a brand. Do you want to open up a brick and mortar eventually? That is the goal. Okay. You know, everyone who has come through has always told me when are you going to open a restaurant. For me, is it's a very interesting time right now with everything from financials to the way people are spending money on fine dining. Uh huh. Yeah, and oh. so <laughs> you would know. Let me let's do this. This is the fun part of the podcast. So <laughs> if we were to pont- like if we were to ideate on what it is and where it is. So so none of us exists today. You have some wins. You, you're starting to see how people are enjoying your experiences that you're bringing to life. Right. And so when you think about the location, everything's on the table. Where would you put it in your head? Like where does it exist in Los Angeles? If, if Los, maybe it's New York city, but where does it exist in your mind? I the mean, location? I'd love to do New York. I love New York. But if I had a choice right now, I choose between our district or Culver city. Okay. I think Arts both Culver. areas are popping. You're seeing a lot more diversity. I love that both of them are walkable because yeah. for me, when I like to go dine and we do bang, bang, bangs. So literally we'll go from one, let's say a bar for a drink, then to a restaurant, then to maybe another bar or another, like a dessert shop. Yeah. And so having that, instead of having to drive around and Uber everywhere. Sure. Okay. So, way. so Culver potentially, and then how big is it? I don't, necessarily want a huge restaurant. I think overhead is huge, but also I'm more about the boutique experience. You imagine like this table yeah. is about the size of one of our tables that we have, but we set 14 on, on one of these 14 tables. Yeah. 14 tops, 14 tops. Yeah. Okay. But we, you know, the Roslyn supper club itself only has 19 seats, yeah. little city farms. We have 40 to 60, but all this kind of wide format. Okay. And so the goal for me is to make an intimate experience. I want you to be able to sit here and either myself or one of my chefs are there talking to you about each dish. There's, yeah. you know, our, dedicated psalm is pouring you wine just for your table because okay. it's about you. It's like right? maybe 50 seats with a bar. If yeah, maybe exactly. And I definitely okay. want a bar. So here's the concept that I actually would, would love to pitch you, right? Yeah, is let's do it. The concept that I've been developing over the last two years with my you know business partners and friends is if we were to have a reverse speakeasy, if the bar was up front open to the public mm-hmm. and it's beautiful, I'm talking the craft cocktails, the same craft cocktails we do at Roslyn, but it's up front and you get small bites of what we do at Roslyn but you can't get the full experience unless you're invited or you have a membership or you have an NFT connected to it. And then you can go to the back, which is the reverse, which is the supper club yeah. type model. Okay. Yeah. I think I have a location for you. Actually. <laughs> like it's a vibe, right? Yeah. Cause everyone's going, why did, why does that person get to go walk in the back? What is going on there? It's like, Oh, you need an invitation. Right. 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 Yeah. The but, experience of it all. Correct. Yeah. And like, I like to blast music too. So we do like nineties, two thousands R and B all night long. I love that. Yeah. Oh. Necessary. All right. We're going to do something. I, th- I think I have something in mind for you that will pitch you off air. Sounds good. What else do people know where they can find you and obviously find out about the supper club. Nick wants to know where to take his next date. So Easy. give all, give everyone the Instagram. <laughs> yeah. My Instagram is uh, Jasper, the letter H and then L Y N N. Uh, Roslyn is very simple. It's R O S A L Y N N supper club. And uh, that's the best way to get all the updates about what we're doing yeah. from my individual products to Yeet Hay to, of course, booking with us at Roslyn. Yeah. And then uh, definitely check out Little City Farms, though. Yeah, like, we're amazing. doing some cool stuff with them. Shout out to Rebecca for putting this all together. I know. Thanks, Rebecca. All right. Thanks, Chef. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me on the show. This has been a lot of fun. Amazing. Cheers, right. dude. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.